All right, so it's just about two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar on the seven habits of highly effective nonprofits. Um, we will be sending out a recording and slides of this webinar after we're done. Um, I'm just so happy that you were all able to join me today and spend your afternoon with me. We'll try to keep it to 30 minutes. My name is Linda Gerhardt, and I'm a community engagement specialist here at Mighty Cause. Since 2016, I've been working with nonprofits at Mighty Cause, and before that, I worked for nonprofits um, in the animal welfare sector, um, nonprofits large and small in marketing and communications. Um, so I'm a resource for all of you, so if you'd ever want to reach out and schedule a call or run a fundraising idea past me, you can always email me at lynda at mightycause.com. Um, just to go over a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in, I'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So if you think of a question while I'm presenting, just type it into the questions box on your GoToWebinar panel, and we'll make sure to get to it at the end of the presentation. So as you all probably surmised from the title of this webinar, it's inspired by Covey's famous Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is a book most professionals encounter, encounter at some point in their careers. Um, and even if you haven't read this book, you've probably encountered some of the lingo and concepts, and you'll usually run into these concepts again at any sort of leadership training or professional retreat. The habits are be proactive, begin with the end in mind, put first things first, think win-win, seek first to understand, then be understood, synergize and sharpen the saw. Um, if you haven't read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I definitely recommend it, but you don't need to know these for this webinar. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot, of the, a, a lot of time in the weeds with these concepts, and instead we're going to use them as a platform to talk about seven things nonprofits do when they're successful, regardless of size, that makes them effective in the work. So here are the seven habits of highly effective nonprofits, um, and we'll be going through each one of these in the presentation. So one question you may have is why focus on what other nonprofits do? And there are a lot of good reasons to scope out what's working for other nonprofits. First, you can find the bright spots and replicate success. Um, and in using the phrase, find the bright, bright spots, I'm referencing another book called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard by Chip and Dan Heath. And in their book, they talk about finding the bright spots as an approach to solving problems. Instead of trying to fix what's not working, you focus on what is working. And that applies when you're looking outside of your own work as well. You can solve problems by simply looking at what's working for others and then replicating their success and their methods. Examining what other nonprofits do well can also help you design a roadmap for maximizing your nonprofit's impact and learn from others in your field. And finally, by looking at others, you can see what creates impact because you're able to see what nonprofits are doing and what's having an effect on their the area of concern that they're working on. And then you can also see what stymies it. And with that, we'll move on to the first habit. Um, the first habit is proactively engaging with your base. So being proactive may seem obvious, but it's one thing highly effective nonprofits always make a point of doing. One of the biggest things they do is they get out into the communities they're serving and become a presence from showing up to community events to working with local businesses. They are really proactive in getting their name and their work out there and make in-person touch touches whenever possible. They also network, which can mean meeting with other nonprofit leaders in the area, making business contacts, calling up the local news and seeing if their work can be included in a segment, attending conferences, booking speaking engagements and proposing workshop ideas for conferences and so on. A lot of nonprofits can be more passive in their approach to getting their nonprofit's name and work out there, thinking that if they do good work, then people will come to them but highly effective nonprofits promote themselves and work proactively to get themselves known and get their name and their work and their message out there, which in turn allows them to do even more and better work in their area of concern. Another thing highly effective nonprofits do is proactively create pathways for people at every entry point in their organization. That means instead of just calling it a day when someone emails them with a question or comes into their lobby 
or calls them on the phone, they use it as a jumping off point to get each individual involved in their organization, whether it's by sending a follow-up email, getting their email address and their mailing address over the phone so they can add them to their lists, or having sign-up sheets and brochures about their work in the lobby, they consider every touch point an opportunity for a new supporter. They also, across the board, have a donor pipeline, which is just a path you move your donors down when they make their first gift that attempts to bring them back for a second gift and a third gift and so on. And lastly, effective nonprofits are always seeking out new opportunities to engage with the public and their supporters. So going back to how highly infect, effective nonprofits in, actively engage, here's a look at what they do to keep people engaged when they enter the donor pipeline or make contact with their nonprofit by making their first donation. First, they thank them, but they make it personal by sending a handwritten card or sending a well done letter or a snazzy email, make it fun, meaning they're not usually sending a form letter that's as interesting as dry toast, and always, always, always connect the work, the, the thank you back to their work, letting the donor know how much it helped, what it'll be used for, what it ensures that, and it, that just works to ensure that donating is a gratifying experience, which of course makes it more likely that they'll donate again. You have all the tools to do this through Mighty Cause because you have your donor's information on your donation report. So think about how you can refresh your thank you, thank you and make it feel personal and more fun and engaging. They also make a point of getting to know their supporters because the better you know your supporters, the better you can engage with them and make appeals to them. So you can send a personalized email, actually hop on the phone and have a develop or have a development coordinator give them a call to welcome to th them to your organization if it's a first time donor and find out what brought them to your work and follow up with an invite to an event to get them moving on to the next stage in involvement. Uh, Mighty Cause does have a tool to help with this for premium subscribers called Supporters, which are complete donor records where you can enter in what you know about them, what segments they belong to, and your history with them, and everything they've done for your nonprofit so that you can communicate better with them. And when, as you learn about these donors, you can make sure that you're making notes about the things you know. During their communications with donors, highly effective nonprofits are careful to close the loop on their campaigns. Say, for instance, your nonprofit is a food bank and you have, or a soup kitchen, and you have a campaign to raise money for a new industrial dish, dishwasher. You've thanked your donors, but after the campaign ends, you never mention your dishwasher again. So even though your donors have been acknowledged and they have their tax receipts, you didn't finish the job by updating them about buying the dishwasher. Something as simple as posting an update to your fundraiser saying that you purchased the new dishwasher with a picture of a volunteer using it is enough to close the loop and leave your donors feel, feeling gratified that they helped purchase it. And the last thing I'll mention here is that highly effective nonprofits always have a plan for moving donors into the next phase and they plan for how they're going to move each donor along the pipeline. It's always part of the process of a campaign and it's part of the process of planning out their year. So if you're not including follow-up and mapping out next steps when your campaign is over, you can become more effective by adding that step to the process when you're planning and running a campaign. All right, so a common concern we hear from nonprofits, especially when we talk about um, being proactive and reaching out is donor fatigue. Um, some nonprofits can be super concerned with contacting people too much or being too proactive and pushing people away by bugging them. But the thing is, people are donating because they're interested in your cause and they want to get involved. So it's often an unfounded fear because communicating with your donors regularly will help prevent donor fatigue. And what does cause donor fatigue is when you only communicate with your donors when you have an ask. So of all the touches we've listed here, these are mostly non-asks. You're getting to know them, you're inviting them to events, you're following up on a campaign, thanking them, building a relationship. The thing to be worried about is bumming out your donors by acting like the friend who only calls when they need something. Highly effective nonprofits treat their friends, their donors like friends who they want to talk to, that they want to get to know better, and they reach out regularly. They want to find out what they're doing and what's on their mind. All right, so the next habit is setting and working toward high-level goals. 
Goal setting is so important in nonprofits, and these are the goals highly effective nonprofits have written out and they've discussed at length and are actively working toward. Short-term goals, long-term goals, financial goals, of course, and programmatic goals, what you hope to achieve with your work. In order to set effective goals, you need to determine a metric for measuring your success. For instance, if your goal were to increase donor retention in 2018, you'd look at your donor retention rate to see whether or not you've achieved that. And that's in your Mighty Cause analytics if you're a premium subscriber. Um, and there's also tougher, harder to quantify goals related to your work. They need some metric to evaluate to determine whether or not you've achieved them or not, or if you still have a little bit to go. Highly effective nonprofits also regularly assess their progress toward these goals, not just at the end of the fiscal year or the start of a new calendar year, but on a monthly or even more frequent basis. A huge part of what makes some nonprofits so effective is the goal setting process. They're not just getting out there and saying they'll do their best to work toward their mission. They have specific and measurable ways in which they want to move the needle and they work strategically to get the results they've defined as important to their organization's work. And this ties into the next habit of highly effective nonprofits, which is that they prioritize. In the next few slides, we'll talk about a few methods I've seen effective nonprofits use to prioritize their work so they don't get lost in the weeds and they can work toward the high level goals that they've set for themselves. The first is called the bucket method. And I first encountered this when I was working at a large national animal welfare nonprofit in a department that addressed a lot of issues. And when I say that we addressed a lot of issues, I mean that our department pretty much dealt with anything related to pets. So it was really easy to lose focus when our focus is that vast. Our department sorted through all these issues by defining three to four buckets that we could sort the work into based on the goals we set out to achieve in the goal setting process. And when a question or an issue was dropped on us or someone from another department or the public or another nonprofit asked for our help in our work on something, we used the bucket method to determine what to do. Because if we didn't prioritize our work, we'd be spinning our wheels and we'd get nothing done. So we had our three buckets and we'd ask ourselves, does this issue fit in any of our buckets? If the answer was yes, we sorted it into the appropriate bucket and got to work. If the answer was no, we took a step back and asked ourselves if doing this work would help us achieve any of our high level goals. And if the answer was no, we said no to the request. And saying no can be super hard to do when you're in the nonprofit sector because you're there because you want to help. But it's also necessary if you want to be effective because no organization can do everything and say yes to every request and work on every issue. It made us more effective because we were able to hone in on the areas where we could have the most impact, which helped us achieve our goals and move the needle on issues we defined as high priority. It also, it also kept us from getting lost in the weeds and losing our focus. Um, so buckets are not always stationary. Sometimes you need to add a bucket or eliminate a bucket if you see work coming in that never gets sorted into any, any of the buckets. But it's an easy way for everyone on your team to prioritize and make quick decisions that will help your organization be most effective. Moving on to the next method, we're going to talk about commander's intent. And this is a military term, and basically all it means is that it's a quick, succinct way for leaders to describe what constitutes success. It starts at the top with the commander, which in the case of nonprofits would be your board of directors or your executive director, and then it filters down the ranks. The people at the bottom end don't know, need to know every single step that will get you towards success, but they do need to know your commander's intent and understand that that is the ultimate goal. So for instance, if you're working for a food bank and your commander's intent is to feed more people in your community, it's simple and clear, it, that's what constitutes success, is feeding more people in your commu community. And where this helps prioritize is looking at an issue and filtering it through commander's intent. 
So as an example, if your team at the food bank is planning a gala and your team is in a heated discussion about what to put on the menu and really fussing over what is appropriate to put on the menu, commander's intent can help your staff cut through the work and discussions that take up time and distract from your ultimate goal. Um, for the menu debate, you can simply ask, does fretting over this menu choice at our gala help us feed more people in our community? And the answer to that is obviously no. So you can put that discussion to bed and move on. It can also help you sort through requests and ideas. Um, if somebody has an idea, even if it's a really great one, if it doesn't help you feed more people in your community, if it doesn't align with your commander's intent, then it's not a priority. Utilizing a commander's intent, like the bucket method, helps your nonprofit really focus in on what you're trying to do as an organization and cut through all the stuff that might be great to do, but doesn't help you get toward those high level goals you've set for your organization. When you really laser focus on your goals, you'll become more effective as an organization and make sure that you and your staff are spending your time and mental energy on the things that will help you achieve the goals that you set out to do. The next habit is building relationships. This ties back into what we were talking about earlier about being proactive. The process of building a relationship with a donor is called stewarding from the first gift and beyond. Nonprofits steward people, not businesses or corporations. So even when you're working with a corporate sponsor, you're not stewarding the business as a whole. You're stewarding and building relationship with, relationships with your contacts at the business. And stewarding is really all about getting to know your donors, finding out what moves them, what they care most about, what inspires them. And to do that, you have to communicate with them outside of asks. And it can include everything from sending an online survey to hopping on the phone with a donor, to even meeting with them for coffee and just chatting with them about your work and how they want to be involved. It's the sort of old school personal contact um, that a lot of development directors were accustomed to before everything moved online. And by building this relationship with the donor, you can move them through the pipeline and increase their involvement at your organization. For instance, if you have a, a highly engaged donor who gives regular gifts, you can talk to them about volunteering or getting involved as a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. If you have a donor who is also a volunteer and is always willing to come out to support your organization, you can have them mentor volunteers or move them into other areas of your nonprofit, like training them to help with social media or development work, depending on what their interests and skills are. Highly effective nonprofits steward well, and that's why they have armies of supporters who will always show up for them when they need it. And that's what allows them to have a huge impact. And you really do have all the information you need in your donation report on Mighty Cause to get started stewarding if you're currently just calling it a day after the thank you. And for premium subscribers, our donor records can be a huge help in this prog process. Um, soon we'll also be releasing some cool new tools that will be an even bigger help with stewarding. So keep an eye on your email for some announcements about those new tools. The other side to this is building relationships with businesses and corporate sponsors. We do have a blog and a previous webinar that goes into the, the nitty gritty of how to secure a corporate sponsorship. And the URL is at the bottom of the slide and I'll include it in the follow up email. But essentially all that goes into it is prospecting, finding businesses that would be a good fit for your nonprofit's work and then making contact. You send an email, make a call, follow up until you can schedule a meeting. With sponsorships and business relationships, the key is finding an arrangement that is a win-win for both parties. For instance, if you're running a charity walk and you want a corporate, you want a corporate sponsor, a win-win would be them paying to sponsor the walk at a certain level in exchange for booth space at the walk, putting their logo on a t-shirt that your walkers will wear and inserting some information about their business into the goodie bags that you hand out to walkers. You make your pitch, you follow up and you stay in touch. And even if the answer is no, you wanna stay in touch because you may always be able to go back to them for an event or an ask that's a better fit for them. Highly effective nonprofits are really great at leveraging business partnerships, not only to keep their work funded, but to help raise awareness about their work and become a presence in their communities. Moving on to habit number five, we've got meeting your base where they are. 
All right, so what does that mean? Meet your people where they are. On a very basic level, it means going to where the people are physically. Let's say your nonprofit is an animal shelter, and one of your goals is to get more pets in your community spayed and neutered. But your clinic is a bus ride away from areas where there's the greatest need, and people can't take their pets with them on the bus to get to your clinic. So your clinic isn't going to be very effective because you're not physically where the people are. But you can work on providing transport for pets, invest in a mobile clinic, or work with a vet somewhere closer to provide these services at a location people can actually reasonably get to with their pets. And that's just one example of being physically in the community that you want to help. And it can also mean just looking at a calendar of community events and seeing what's coming up in your community and making a point of showing up and being there and having your face and your name there. But beyond the obvious meeting, highly effective nonprofits meet people where they are mentally and philosophically as well. And that's where Covey's habit, understand, then seek to be understood, really comes in handy for nonprofits. Um, you can't serve a community or demographic unless you truly understand where they're coming from. And there's nothing that's more of an impediment to creating transformational change in a community or society as a whole than barging in and saying, okay, this is how things should be done and we're going to educate you about how to do them. Um, as an example of how this works, um, once upon a time, there were a bunch of nonprofits that sought to end chaining dogs. Um, the nonprofits sought to outlaw it. They shamed people who chained their dogs. They were seeking to be understood rather than understanding first. But when a lot of nonprofits took the step of actually knocking on the doors of the places where these dogs were chained up, they found that a lot of these owners really loved and cared for their pets, but their dogs kept running away for two reasons. They weren't spayed and neutered and the owners couldn't afford to get it done. And number two, they couldn't afford to build a fence because fences are super expensive. So for whatever reason, they the solution that they came up with was to keep their dog on a chain. So not ideal, but the nonprofits shifted their focus from criminalizing and condemning what these people were doing and started doing whatever it took to get the dogs off the chains, which was often just providing help with spay neuter and helping them build fences in their backyard so the dogs wouldn't have to be on, on a chain. And when they refocused and met these pet owners where they were, they were able to get so many more dogs off their change, chains and be more effective than just coming in with their own agenda and telling pet owners what they should do. And this is also the high level goal setting we talked about earlier. They prioritized their goal, which was to get dogs off of chains and focused on whatever it took to achieve that goal. And meeting people where they are is also a matter of talking to people in a way that makes sense to them, um, avoiding jargon and looking at any barriers that might exist that keeps people from accessing your message and your work, whether it's an actual physical barrier or a language issue, which brings us to our next slide, which is all about jargon. Um, jargon is one of the biggest barriers in the nonprofit sector and its use is a huge sign that a nonprofit is not meeting people where they are. To be effective communicators with the public, you need to avoid the use of jargon. And jargon is anything that is not easily understood by people outside of your own circle. For instance, if you go into a community and start talking to people about food justice, that probably doesn't make sense to a lot of people. It's inside baseball talk and it puts a wedge between your nonprofit and the people that you're trying to reach. Another example is when I worked for an animal shelter and our ultimate goal was to get animals adopted. Um, but our behavior team would wanna list things like Fido is dog reactive and needs an experienced owner on a dog's profile and not realize that the term dog reactive is total gibberish to people who don't work in dog behavior. It makes no sense and so people didn't know what it meant. So they passed Fido over in the shelter because it sounded like a really bad thing and they couldn't understand what it was. So the use of jargon was keeping us away from meeting our goal of finding homes for animals. Literally every type of nonprofit in the sector has its own jargon and I'm using animal welfare because that's what my background is in and where I've seen it play out personally. Um, but to combat it, your message can reach more people. You need to step away from your own knowledge and look at things with a fresh perspective. Take a look at the things you say in a day's work and note what probably wouldn't make sense to others. And then apply that to all of your communications, whether it's emails, talking to people on the phone, putting together pamphlets, and so on. Um, highly effective nonprofits are able to reach more people with their message 
because they apply a filter for jargon when they're talking to people and preparing communications so that no one is turned off by them and tunes them out by using words that don't make sense to them. And another faux pas that I see all the time, which you'll rarely see from the most effective nonprofits in the country, is education. Unless you're an actual literal education nonprofit, nonprofits shouldn't seek to educate the public because the implication of that is that the public is dumb and needs education. I mean, imagine how you would react if you went somewhere for help and for guidance and the person you talked to said, okay, I'm gonna educate you about this issue. It's off-putting and condescending and talks down to people. So instead of educate, you may just wanna shift the language to sharing information, providing resources, providing suggestions, and helping with solutions. Those are more positive and less likely to turn people away because you're meeting them from a place of equality and helping becoming a helpful resource instead of an authority figure who's trying to educate them. So that's one thing you'll see effective nonprofits do over and over again is use intentional language and use it in an accessible way. Okay, so moving on, the next habit is collaborating and building coalitions. Coalition building sounds really intimidating, but it's actually not too complicated. You're just finding allies with a shared mission and working with them to achieve some shared goals. Sometimes your best allies are other nonprofits doing the same type of work. Um, to draw from my own personal experience, um, again, an animal shelter I worked for in a big city started, started a coalition with other animal shelters in the area. Instead of working separately or even competitively, they worked together as a coalition. They were still totally separate entities with their own policies and operations and approaches, but they started collaborating on the shared goal of sending more animals to new homes. And each individual shelter was able to have a greater impact and help more animals by working together rather than separately. All you wanna do is find potential allies, give them a call, send them an email, meet up with them, brainstorm ideas, and like with business partnerships, create a win-win solution where both organizations can get something from the alliance. Set goals for yourselves, work together, help each other out, and get to work. So the Animal Shelter Coalition, for instance, found that they were all struggling with kitten season, which is in the spring and summer when shelters are just flooded with cats. And they started a program to, with the goal to send home 500 cats collectively over the course of the spring and summer. And they promoted it together, they measured their success together, and they brainstormed ideas to help them get to those 500 adoptions, and they eventually ended up exceeding it, so everyone involved was able to publicly celebrate that success. Highly, non highly effective nonprofits are always happy to partner up and work with other nonprofits and join coalitions that help them achieve their goals and further their mission. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the last habit of highly effective nonprofits, which is practicing self-care, um, which is the counterpart to Covey's sharpening the saw. So this is something um, nonprofits don't really talk about enough, and that's a healthy work-life balance. That means not taking non-emergency calls on weekends, not answering non-emergency emails on vacation or any emails on vacation, and actually using your vacation days. Um, this is hard for a lot of nonprofit nonprofit professionals because it's not just a job, it's a passion, and it becomes part of who you are, it becomes part of your identity. But it's so essential to take good care of yourself so that you can do the best work possible for your calls. Find allies in a support system, whether it's a meetup with other nonprofit professionals, joining a closed Facebook group for people in your field, or just reaching out if you're having a, a tough time and feeling overwhelmed. Um, I've listed some resources for compassion fatigue that are worth checking out because compassion fatigue leads to burnout and that leads to bad decisions. And it's something people in the nonprofit world need to take seriously and be proactive about. Nonprofit workers that often end up absorbing the stress and even trauma from the people that they're trying to help. And highly effective nonprofits have leaders who practice self-care, are aware of compassion fatigue and can recognize it in themselves and in others and work to combat it so doing work that you love and that you care about doesn't end up hurting you. 
It's also important to encourage your staff and volunteers to practice self-care, and that often just means checking in regularly with your staff, not just about the work, but just how they're doing in general in life. Developing a support system for employees, which can even just be as simple as cross-training staff and volunteers so that people can easily take vacations and days off if they need them and not be the only person who knows how to do a particular thing. Um, it means encouraging a healthy work-life balance and not contacting your staff and volunteers off the clock if it's not 100% necessary, respecting their personal time, and allowing them the space they need to conduct their own lives. You can make them aware of any resources you have, like an employee assistance program or hotlines that they can call if they need someone to talk to. And there are a lot of great speakers who address compassion fatigue, so you can do some research and invite one out for a lunch and learn, or even just stream a TED Talk for free about the subject and have a discussion afterward at a staff meeting. The reason self-care is so important and why it's something effective nonprofits focus on is that people cannot do their best job at a nonprofit when they're struggling to keep their heads above water. And stressed employees and volunteers eventually leave. They burn out and then they leave you and then you have to spend time recruiting new people and training them how to do their jobs instead of working towards your high level goals. It helps to lead by example, not just in being a leader who cares for yourself, but also modeling the compassion you wanna sow in your community in the way you do business. And lastly, it helps attract talented volunteers and employees and keep them once you've got them so that you can nurture them and have the best possible team doing the work. All right, so we're just at about 30 minutes. Um, we're at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna um, take some questions now. And if you do need to sign off, that's absolutely fine. Um, but we are gonna make some time for questions. Okay, um, so the first question is about um, notes and recording. You will get the slides and you'll also get the recording. Um, somebody saying that yes, prioritizing has helped them a lot. Um, more time to focus on what's important. So that's um, a tip that I hope you take away. It's okay to say no to things. You don't have to do everything and be everything at your nonprofit. You can say no to a project. You can say no to a proposal if it's not in line with what you're trying to achieve. So I really hope that um, the bucket method and commander's intent are helpful. But if not, either you can always find other ways of prioritizing that work better for you, come up with your own system. And if you have a really awesome system for prioritizing, email me. I love that kind of stuff. And I can include it in our next webinar where we talk about priorities. All right, so we've got um, one question about donor fatigue. Um, when it comes to donor fatigue, we do often hear from people that we're communicating too much. So how do you deal with that when determining how to follow up? And that's a really great question. And the first thing I'll say is, before you say a lot of people are contacting us, really look at how many people you're actually hearing from. Get actual numbers and take a critical look at that. Because if you send an email to 500 people and get two responses saying, holy cow, you guys email me too much, it's really annoying, that's 498 people who are not contacting you to tell you that you email them too much. So of course the people who actually contacted you to let you know that you're emailing them too much are gonna stick in your mind, but just try to keep it in perspective and look at the big picture and don't let a couple of people get in your head and dictate your strategy. Um, and this is also part of just getting to know your donors. If there are some people who would prefer to be contacted less, put a note in their donor record and contact them less. Like you can absolutely do that. You don't have to have one strategy for everybody. And if some donors hate it when you call them, make a note in their donor record and don't call them. Um, but don't let a noisy few scare you away from communicating regularly or scare you away from having a proactive follow-up plan in place. All right, so um, the next question is about the bucket method. Um, how do you choose what your buckets are and how do you say no to something that could help someone but doesn't fit into the buckets? Um, which is another really awesome question. Um, basically, your high level goals are going to determine what your buckets are. So uh, for instance, at the, the animal welfare organization I worked for, we decided that we worked, we're gonna concentrate on three areas in a year, which were pets and shelters, pets and housing, community cats, just as an example, and those were our buckets. Those were the issues we wanted to work on as a priority. 
Um, and saying no is hard, um, but sometimes the best way to do it is just let people know that you'd love to help, but you're focusing on other priorities at the moment and offer a few suggestions or resources where they can find help. Um, as another example, when I worked for the same nonprofit, an activist who was really motivated contacted me about her issue that she was working on, which was secondhand smoke's effect on pets. And I listened to her and we had a great chat and I agreed with her that it was important, but I had to let her know that we were prioritizing other things. And we really just ended the conversation um, with me giving her some information about organizations that were more health focused and veterinary focused that she could contact and see if she was able to work with. And she did actually end up teaming up with one of those organizations um, about the issue of secondhand smoke in pets. So you can say no, um, the best way to do it is to soften a blow um, with giving them a path forward and a few other people they can try or organizations they can try um, just so that they have a path to where they wanna go as well. All right. Um, there's a question about a little about uh, communicating specifically for, with um, a nonprofit, and I will email you offline. But yes, I will get in touch with you. And it looks like that is it for today. Um, so we're a little bit over time, but thank you guys so much for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time and hope you got some helpful information out of it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a few big announcements coming about new tools that will be available to you. So watch your inboxes for that news. Um, and you can always email me. My email address is lynda at mightycause.com. I'm happy to set up a call and chat with you. So don't be afraid to proactively reach out. Um, and that's it for our presentation. Thank you guys so much and have an awesome day.